Okay, so we'll just wait one more minute uh, for other people to walk in. And could you please switch off your cell phones if you still have them on? Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Jayant Pandari, and uh, good morning and welcome to another year of Capitalism and Morality Seminar. Um, thank you. Uh, 20 years back was the first time I left India. That was the first time I ever left India. And I went to the UK to study. Uh, and my friends and family those days uh, discouraged me from going to the UK, telling me that grass always looked greener on the other side. Um, once I was in the UK, in a few months I realized that the grass was not only greener on the other side, it was a lot greener than I, had, I could imagine before I left India. Um, I was broke those days. I did my laundry once in three months. People, of course, stayed away from me. Um, I could not afford a bus ride. Um, but for the next few months, I was soaking in knowledge about what made the Western societies so prosperous, peaceful, and civilized. Those two years became the best two years of my life. Alas, in the last 20 years, things in the world have changed drastically. India and China have become much freer, optimistic, and self-reliant, whereas the West has decided to become a lot less free at an increasing pace. Contrary to a lot of libertarians, I believe that the roots of our social problems are not so much in the politicians and bureaucrats, but in our own collective minds. A society that lacks intellectual integrity will invariably, as a symptom, produce a corrupt social structure and a cancerous growth called the state. What needs most work are our own beliefs and attitudes. And it's based on this that the speakers come and speak in this seminar. This seminar celebrates the idea of human freedom. This is not a seminar that will motivate you towards political action against the stupidity, short-sightedness, and sheer criminal behavior of our rulers. But we'll seek to show how, instead of resisting, we look for solutions that are within our grasp, and to see how we can live a freer life. Today will indeed be a magical day for all of you. I have always thought that those who become fans of celebrities demean themselves and their spirit. But I must confess that everyone who speaks in this seminar is someone I'm a big, big fan of. I would like to now speak a few words about our first uh, speaker. Only last year, two great friends of mine, Reagan and David, gave me a lecture series called V50, taught by J. Stuart Snelson. I had never heard of him before. But then I also realized that I had never heard of Ayn Rand when I read Fountainhead. It was a 48-hour-long lecture series. Listening to the lecture reminded me of the cathartic feeling I got when I first read Fountainhead. Mr. S. Nelson's lecture provided me tools to integrate various beliefs, understanding, and understandings about life and science, providing me a potent leverage. This lecture of Mr. S. Nelson has influenced, very strongly influenced, Many people here, including Doug Casey, Rick Rule, Jack Perksley, the late Jack Perksley, unfortunately, Harry Brown, among many others. What else should one say to introduce this legend? Ladies and gentlemen, with that, I would like to invite J. Stuart Snelson. Thank you, Jayant. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here. I've chosen a, a, a perhaps rather cumbersome title to talk about win-win theory on taming the violence of faith and win-win solutions for our world in crisis. I have a little bit, uh, perhaps uh, over an hour, to tell you about taming the violence of faith through the application of what I call win-win theory and its connection with capitalism and morality, 
which is, of course, the title of this symposium. But to do that, I have to get your attention, and to help me, I need to know something about you. For example, am I speaking to, let's say, a choir of libertarians who are all anxious to achieve freedom? I don't know. If you are a part of the libertarian choir, can you learn anything here today that you don't already know? I'm going to ask you three questions on liberty without defining the term liberty. And after we read the three questions, I'll ask you for a show of hands as to your preference. So first of all, they are, I'll read these and then I'll ask you for a show of hands. One, Canada and America have too much liberty. Two, Canada and America have the right amount of liberty. And three, Canada and America have too little liberty. All right, if you're in the first category, number one, please raise your hand. Canada and America have too much liberty. Anyone? Uh, <laughs> all right. I, I don't see any hands up. All right. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. What can I say? Uh, I, I can't top that. <laughs> okay, two, Canada and America have the right amount of liberty. Anyone? No one. And three, Canada and America have too little liberty. All right, well, that appears to be nearly all of you. Um, all right, I'm now going to ask you a converse question on servitude. That is what we call involuntary servitude, which, of course, prevails where liberty is entirely missing. As before, we're going to read these off. Number one. Uh, Canada and America have too little involuntary servitude. Two, Canada and America have the right amount of involuntary servitude. Three, Canada and America have too much involuntary servitude. And four, Canada and America shouldn't have any involuntary servitude. All right, let's see who's in the first category. Canada and America have too little involuntary servitude. Any hands? Just jump to four, James. <laughs> I hear just jump to four, save the time. Well, we don't want to leave anybody out. Uh, number two, Canada and America have the right amount of involuntary servitude. Uh, no one. Three, Canada and America have too much involuntary servitude. All right. We have half a dozen, maybe a dozen people. All right. Four, Canada and America shouldn't have any involuntary servitude. All right. That's the, the large majority of you. Now that you know, now that I have some idea at least where you're coming from, here's where I'm coming from. So. You won't get impatient in determining, well, where is he going with his lecture? Here is the grand aim of what I call win-win theory. Win-win theory applies the scientific method of causality identification and verification to maximize the causes of world peace, world prosperity, and world freedom, and minimize the causes of world war, world poverty, and world servitude. Now, to be sure, that's an ambitious aim, I admit that. But it's also, as I will demonstrate, a practical aim if, if you can identify and verify social cause and effect. In other words, can we discover which social causes lead to which social effects? Well, the answer is yes, if you know how. If you know how. The secret to knowing how is derived from the successful application of the scientific method as the key to solving social problems, both large and small. Now, to do this, we have to have a strategy, a method, with the power to gain success. To reach the same, it's crucial to discuss a subject of study that is so important, that is so significant, it is so profound most people have never heard of it. And here's one reason why they've never heard of it. The more important the subject of discourse, the less the interest. How many of you have taken a college or university level course in epistemology? Let me see a show of hands. Epistemology. One? One person? Two? Did I miss anyone? Two people. All right. Where human survival as a species is the aim. 
the most important subject of discourse to study is epistemology. Now in this elite audience, even if you have not taken a formal course in epistemology, many of you know epistemology investigates the nature of knowledge, the limits of knowledge, and the methods most importantly employed to gain that knowledge. What are our means of gaining the knowledge? What's our strategy? And so epistemology is the theory of knowledge in simple language. The epistemologist asks one of the most important questions you can ever ask, how do we know that we know anything about anything? The quality of our knowledge can be no better than the method or strategies that we apply to reach this knowledge. Now every philosophy major has heard of epistemology because it's a branch of philosophy. And although the term epistemology was not introduced until the mid-19th century, epistemology as a theory of knowledge has been around for several thousand years. But what has not been around for most of this time is the superior giant advance in epistemology that came about since Galileo and Newton discovered and articulated what we today call the scientific method of causality identification. The greatest advance in epistemology came about as a result of its unification with the scientific method. The famed astrophysicist, <clears throat> who many of you know of, Arthur Eddington, modified the term epistemology in the 20th century to read scientific epistemology. The heart of scientific epistemology is the scientific method. And the heart of the scientific method is independent observation and verification of physical, biological, and social phenomena. Well, what's so special about the scientific method? Most people could care less. Probably not one in 10,000 college graduates can articulate it, if that. What's the big deal as opposed to other methods of understanding cause and effect? Well, the scientific method has proven to be the most reliable method ever conceived to identify and verify which physical, biological, and social causes lead to which effects. In short, the scientific method is the prime key to understanding cause and effect. Well, again, we might ask, well, why is it so important to understand cause and effect? Write me an essay. That would be, if we had time, I'm serious, I would have all of you write an essay, come up here and read the essay. What's the big deal about understanding cause and effect? Well, here's one of the big deals. The fundamental cause of world war, world poverty, and world servitude is the general failure of the educated and the uneducated classes to understand which social causes lead to which social effects. Humans have consistently aimed for peace, prosperity, and freedom by imposing the very policies that lead to war, poverty, and servitude. That is not bright. <laughs> Where you miss the target by 180 degrees, please note your aim is poor. <laughs> People with such poor aim they may be bright, they may be educated, they may be tireless, but one thing is certain, they don't know what they're doing. Whether it's been either bad guys or good guys who don't know what they're doing, in either case the consequences have been catastrophic. You know, where good guys and bad guys have not known what they're doing, they've acted without knowing which causes lead to which effects. Maybe you recognize this fellow. After Mark Twain, this is America's second greatest humorist of, humorist of the 19th century, Josh Billings. How many, how many have heard of Josh Billings? I see no hands. How many of you are from the States, the United States? All right, quite a few of you. He is America's second greatest humorist. All of you have read, of course, Mark Twain, who's the greatest. Well, Josh Billings, 
gave us three of the most important one-liners of all time. See if his one-liners apply to anyone you know, especially if he or she is an expert in some academic discipline or has many degrees or has written many books. Josh Billings, maxim number one. It ain't what a man don't know that makes him a fool. It's the things he does know that ain't so. <laughs> maxim number two. It is better to know nothing than to know what ain't so. And Billings maxim number three. It is not ignorance that does so much damage. It's knowing so damn much that ain't so. Does, this, does any of this sound familiar? <laughs> You've heard that attributed to Mark Twain, but it really was, yeah, it was Josh Billings. But often, often famous quotations, if you do the research on them, the people who they're attributed to never said it, somebody else said it, so you have to be careful with these, especially when you're picking them up off the internet, which has a very poor track record of citation, citing the origin of things. They, they, they don't care. In sharp contrast, please note that if you don't know what is so, and you don't know what isn't so, if you don't know what is so, and you don't know what isn't so, then you can't act on what you don't know. In other words, it's better to know nothing if you are acting on things in contrast that are destructive. <clears throat> Most of the social catastrophes in history have been caused by decent people, good people, who know so darn much that ain't so. And so they act on what ain't so, thinking it is so, but it ain't so. Well, knowing for sure what ain't so, please note, does far more damage than not knowing anything about anything in the first place. And so, knowing what ain't so is the pseudo-intellectual foundation of the miseducation of the educated classes. This has proven to be a social disaster. Here's why. The fundamental cause of the world crisis of pervasive war, rampant poverty, widespread servitude is the miseducation of the educated classes. Now, if you like to compare the miseducated classes, let's say, of Canada with America, uh, I should point out uh, to our Canadian friends that uh, the Canadians are just as miseducated as the Americans, and conversely. How can we rectify this? The solution can be found in a growing number of Canadians and Americans who come to recognize the value of scientific epistemology to identify and verify physical, biological, and social causality. Where the aim is to know which causes lead to which effects, scientific epistemology is the most important and critical subject of study there is. A win-win theory applies scientific epistemology to identify and verify the social actions necessary to optimize the causes of peace, prosperity, and freedom. To optimize is to reach, of course, the greatest degree of some physical, biological, or social aim. Conversely, win-win theory applies scientific epistemology to identify and verify the social actions necessary to attenuate the causes of war, poverty, and servitude. And attenuate, the term most of you know, a useful word, it means to make something thinner and thinner to reduce it in force. The science, for example, of immunology attenuates the, vi the, the, uh, the virulence of pathogens such as smallpox when you are vaccinated with an attenuated, a weakened smallpox virus Rather than kill you, it boosts your immune system to kill the smallpox. All right, here's the question I'd like to ask of anyone 
who would solve any of our salient social problems, and I presume it is all of you. You would solve any of our salient social problems if you knew how. I won't ask for a show of hands. So here's the question. Is your epistemology of knowing causality identification, which social causes lead to which social effects, based on faith and imagination, or is it based on observation and verification? Write me an essay. We can begin by noting humans employ one of two methods in their aim to understand reality. Imagination of causality or observation of causality. The apparent truth of, for example, the win-lose paradigm, which says for us to gain, they must be forced to lose, is which dominates the thinking of especially the educated classes throughout the world. This paradigm is founded entirely upon the imagination of causality. If peace, prosperity, and freedom are ever going to supersede war, poverty, and servitude, the win lose paradigm must be refuted, it must be invalidated, it must be repudiated, again, especially among the educated classes. Uh, just as an aside, it doesn't really matter what the uneducated classes believe. It's totally irrelevant. It only matters what the educated classes believe. If you want to optimize peace, prosperity, and freedom. You say, well, that sounds elitist. It may sound elitist, but it's also the truth. And I'll explain more about that. This means that social systems based on faith and imagination of causality must be superseded by social systems based on observation and verification of causality. Win-win theory applies scientific epistemology to falsify the imagined equity, utility, and morality of the win-lose paradigm, namely, for us to gain, they must be forced to lose in all fields of human endeavor and exchange. Furthermore, there's a two-pronged attack on imagination of the efficiency of the win-lose paradigm. Win-win theory applies the scientific, scientific epistemology to verify the observed equity, utility, and morality of the win-win paradigm, namely, for us to gain, they must gain, in all fields of human endeavor and exchange. Well, you might ask, well, why replace <clears throat> win-lose models of causality with win-win models? The most rewarding paradigm shift anyone could make is to move away from imagining the truth of the win-lose paradigm toward observing the truth of the win-win paradigm. Without this crucial paradigm shift, it will never happen. This is the necessary paradigm shift for attenuating war, poverty, and servitude, and optimizing peace, prosperity, and freedom. But of course, someone will say, but what if this never happens, Mr. Snelson? Well, at best, we face perpetual turmoil, and at worst, extinction. Some might say, yeah, but other than that, what seems to be the problem? <laughs> The laws of nature prevail whether humans like it or not. In lecturing in the marketplace on the subject of human liberty now for nearly half a century, I'd like to think I've learned a few things. Most of the thousands and thousands of my students who enrolled in my seminars had already earned baccalaureate degrees, master's degrees, doctoral degrees from various colleges and universities. They were all well-read, at least in their respective fields of science, engineering, medicine, education, economics, business, law, fine arts, etc. For this reason, it has always been a challenge to get their attention, especially in the beginning of a, of a seminar, and here's why. In general, the longer you go to school, the more books you've read, the harder it is to get your attention on paradigms that transcend conventional wisdom. 
Now this is the problem all of you run into when you try to convince people to give up their allegiance to involuntary servitude and embrace liberty. Almost everybody you talk to has gone to school and read a lot of books. They pride themselves. Well, I'm well read. I have a couple of degrees. That's most of your associates. Schools from kindergarten to graduate school are largely devoted to teaching conventional wisdom. Now every civilization has faced this problem. It's not new. But is it a problem? What's wrong with conventional wisdom? Well, you know, a lot can be wrong with it, especially if it's not true, which means it's false. And so the epistemologist asks, how do we know if there's any wisdom in our conventional wisdom? Write me an essay. And each one will read it to the entire class, if we had time. Be an interesting exercise. To test the truth and validity of conventional wisdom, you have to know which causes lead to which effects. The method with the best track record, certainly of reliability for such testing, is, again, the scientific method. All human progress depends upon a few audacious activists with the courage to challenge and transcend conventional wisdom, which is, of course, to rise above orthodox, orthodox dogma in any field of knowledge. And so in applying win-win theory to solve social problems, you first have to define the problem. If I had the time, again, I would invite each of you to up to the podium, articulate what you believe to be the pressing social problems of our time in order of importance. In any case, you're here because you're concerned about the proliferation of national and world social problems, or you wouldn't be here. But this does not mean that even in this conference of, on capitalism and morality, that there will be agreement on the nature of the problem. If we limit our discussion to identifying the scope and scale of social problems, then there are three world-class problems that transcend all others. Hopefully, these would be on your list. They are the overarching social problems. One, pervasive war. Two, pervasive poverty. Three, pervasive servitude. If we cannot identify and verify which social causes lead to war, poverty, and servitude, it is unlikely that these critical problems will ever be resolved. Now, due to time constraints, I can only give you today premises and conclusions, many of which might require dozens of hours to clarify and even longer to verify. I can't do that in a little over an hour. But win-win theory relies on the science of social causality to identify which causes lead to which social effects. Here's a conclusion on the basic cause of three salient social effects, pervasive war, poverty, and servitude. Each conclusion that I give you will be out of context with no time to support it. But they're all supportable given the time. Here's one. The basic cause of war, poverty, and servitude in the 21st century is the miseducation of the educated classes. For this reason, we are on the threshold of extinction. This is not good. But because you do not know what I mean by miseducation, I will define it. In science, you define your terms or there's no science. That's why the social sciences are devoid of science. Nobody defines their terms. It's virtually all pseudoscience, would be science, of which people get PhDs and write a zillion books on. Miseducation is any increase in any individual's misunderstanding of the true and verified causes of physical effects, biological effects, and social effects. 
In the academic world, the most miseducation is in the so-called social sciences. The least miseducation is in the physical and biological sciences. What is missing from the social science, again, is science. We know that calling a subject science does not make it a science. The failure of the so-called social sciences to diminish the scale of war, poverty, and servitude is the failure to apply scientific observation to optimize the causes of peace, prosperity, and freedom. All right, ladies and gentlemen, with that brief uh, prelude, uh, I said I would at least discuss a little bit about win-win theory. Uh, what's that all about? Well, physicist and professor of history of science, Thomas S. Kuhn, many of you have read some of his works. He popularized the term paradigm in his 1962, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. How many of you have read? This is a classic. Uh, so there's about a dozen of you have read this. Um, Kuhn maintained that scientific progress follows what he called paradigm shifts among scientists on their perception of fundamental cause and effect. Kuhn would say, without paradigm shifts, there is no progress in science. Now, as we know, our paradigms of causality are our worldviews of cause and effect. They are powerful governors of our human actions because we all believe they're true. There are two paradigms of social action that govern how we interact with our fellow humans. One is the win-win paradigm. It can be precisely defined as follows. The win-win paradigm. For us to gain, they must gain. Those who embrace the win-win paradigm as their code of behavior are always looking for opportunities to create win-win exchanges where everyone wins, everyone gains, and nobody loses. In sharp contrast to the win-win paradigm, there is a second paradigm that governs how we interact with our fellow humans. It is the win-lose paradigm. For us to gain, they must lose through force or fraud. All right, who believes this paradigm to be true? Well, no surprise, uh, thugs, robbers, thieves, swindlers believe it to be true. But who else believes it to be true? Those who believe in the truth of the win-lose paradigm include, include most of the two major social classes in the United States and Canada, namely, those who went to school and those who didn't. <laughs> but more than mere thugs, robbers, thieves, swindlers, more than these people believe it to be true. For example, anyone who believes in the efficacy and rectitude of political confiscation of wealth and freedom in any form any form whatsoever has embraced the win-lose paradigm as their personal code of social behavior. No exceptions. Observation of social action confirms the truth of this generalization, even though this observation may sound outrageous to many people. Well, here are a number of incontrovertible generalizations on the nature of various political institutions that anyone can observe for themselves, that is, if they are willing to look. To observe, you've got to be willing to look. That excludes the great majority of people who don't look. The foundation of science is observation of causality. The term causality means the relationship between cause and effect. In contrast, the foundation of non-science or pseudoscience is imagination of causality. Well, if you aim to discover the causes of anything, for example, the causes of war, the causes of poverty, the causes of servitude, you have two choices. You can observe causality or you can imagine causality. We can use the 
Hubble's power of observation to identify the nature, for example, of politics. You know, when you scrap the romance of monarchy, what's left? All political monarchy is founded on win-lose seizure of the people's wealth and freedom at gunpoint. When we falsify the pseudoscience of communism, what's left? All political communism is founded on the win-lose seizure of the people's wealth and freedom at gunpoint. When we refute the nationalistic glory of fascism, what's left? All political fascism is founded on the win-lose seizure of the people's wealth and freedom at gunpoint. Continuing, where am I going with this? When we illuminate the pseudo-egalitarianism of socialism, what is left? All political socialism is founded on win-lose seizure of the people's wealth and freedom at gunpoint. And so anyone can use their own eyes to observe these truths, these general truths on reality of political institutions. They get boring fast, but they also get more controversial depending on who you're talking to. Let's continue with our observation on various institution, institutions of government. In the Western world, as you all know, political democracy is a sacred cow. When political democracy is stripped of its pseudo-egalitarianism, its pseudo-popularism, its pseudo-ethicality, its pseudo-equity, what's left? All political democracy is founded on win-lose confiscation of the people's wealth and freedom at gunpoint. In the West, a holier, holier-than-thou sacred cow is republicanism. All political republicanism is founded on the win-lose confiscation of the people's wealth and freedom at gunpoint. They say, well, wait a minute, Nelson. <laughs> I mean, how do we know that these generalizations are true that, I, that I've just given you? How do you know they're true? How do you know anything's true? Write me an essay. <laughs> Again, because each individual who looks can independently observe that all of these are true. There's nothing to argue. They're incontrovertible based on observation. Science is built on the power of independent observation and verification. That's what gives it its power to change the world. Here's a generalization on politics that anyone, that's you, and everybody you know can observe to be true. All political institutions are founded on the win-lose paradigm for us to gain. They must lose. And how are they going to lose? Through force and fraud. All arguments on behalf of political action, whether they are communist arguments, fascist arguments, royalist arguments, democratic arguments, republican arguments, they're all the same argument. Because the argument is universal, it can be generalized as a principle of political causality. I call it the universal political argument. If we do not confiscate your wealth and freedom at gunpoint, Bad things will happen to you, and good things will not. Uh, have any of you in Canada ever heard any Canadian politicians tell you this, or did all the U.S.? You know, in the United States not long ago, uh, America's, Americans were told, we were all told that if the U.S. Congress does not pass this so-called bailout legislation, and what was that all about? Well, this was to financially bail out America's most incompetent, irresponsible, dishonest, and fraudulent financial institutions. If we do not do this by the very next Monday, remember they said Monday, and it's the end of the weekend, Monday, like the day after Sunday. This, we were told, has to be done or else. Without this critical legislation, it was said, the nation will collapse into economic ruin, soon to be followed by civil unrest, which will lead to civil insurrection. Well, 
Such an economic disaster, it was said, would make America's Great Depression look like a slow day on Sunday. And so the universal political argument is truly universal. It is the cornerstone of all political action. Again, if we do not confiscate your wealth and freedom at gunpoint, bad things will happen to you and good things will not. And furthermore, bad things will happen to your friends and loved ones as well and your associates. Well, the universal political argument has been successful in fooling the two classes of people. Guess who they are? Especially those who went to school and those who didn't. These are the classes that are fooled. But I will point out later, the educated classes are the most fooled. By and large, these classes all have faith and nothing more than faith that the universal political argument is true and valid, thus they act accordingly. But reliance on faith has a poor track record as a method of understanding causality. Faith in the imagination of what is true has proven to be a disaster for the human race. My friends, if I may call you friends, if we cannot improve upon imagination of social causality, the human race will perish in failing to adapt to the environmental aftermath of political funded, deployed and launched weapons of mass destruction. Since the end of World War II, uh, the risk of destroying not only civilization but the entire human species has continued to rise. And you've watched it rise. Although millions of species have gone extinct, as you know, we could be the very first species to disappear from the earth by way of self-extinction. Well, you know, I do have some good news. If we can figure out how we got into this mess in the first place, we may be able to work our way out of it. But you know, you have to know how you got into it or it's hopeless. What went wrong? It would be redundant if I would say again, write me an essay, but that would be part of the seminar if we had time. What went wrong? Write me an essay. Three pages is enough. And then everybody read it, and then we see who agrees. What went wrong? I'll talk about what went wrong with the American experiment with the revolution in politics. Now, if you're a Canadian citizen, or many of you here, you can generalize. The Canadian experiment with political institutions has gone south for the very same reason. Let's talk about the founders of the American Republic, and even if you're Canadians, you probably know much about it. Did these guys do anything special that we might recognize as valuable in our time? The founders of the federal government of 1787 designed history's least coercive, least intrusive, least pervasive political institution for confiscating wealth and freedom. We owe the founders a truly great gratitude for their success on our behalf. The grand political experiment proved this for all time, that little government with little bureaucracy works far better than big government with big bureaucracy. But these iconic founders lacked a crucial piece of knowledge on how to sustain their new republic. They did not know how to, the fancy word is, delimit or limit the scope and scale of legalized confiscation of the people's wealth and freedom at gunpoint. The key founder of the Republic, Thomas Jefferson, in a letter to his friend Edward Carrington, written in 1788, only one year after the 1787 ratification of the Constitution of the United States, that's important, one year later, it's very interesting, 
Jefferson noted a fundamental problem with the federal government, a government which he himself had helped establish. Jefferson predicted an ominous future for the new republic and the United States of America. An ominous future, he said. The natural progress of things is for liberty to yield and government to gain ground. That's in a letter to his friend Edward Carrington, 1788, one year after the ratification. Jefferson was concerned that it is always, always, the natural thing for political government to grow as it forces human liberty into steady decline. He said, that always happens. How often does it happen? Always, always, always. Now, most of you know some history of the federal government since the founding in 1787 at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. You don't have to be a historian to notice that the federal government has been gaining ground year after year, while American liberty has been yielding ground year after year. American political history was confirmed, has confirmed the truth of what I call the Jeffersonian principle of government, which says, the natural progress of things is for liberty to yield and government to gain, to gain ground. This is an observationally verifiable principle of political government. This means that you can independently of Jefferson or anybody else observe the principle to be true. If you are a Canadian, you know that it's also true of the Canadian Federation since 1867. Most of you read the key, the key elements of the Constitution of the United States. Here's one you know by heart, probably even if you're a Canadian. Article 1, Section 8, quote, the Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, period. Now what's that mean? We know that a duty is what? A tax, isn't it? What's an impost? A tax. What's an excise? A tax. So the Constitution clearly states in clear English for all to read, the federal government shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, 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 and more taxes without limit. Now beyond the federal government, you've likely noticed that the local states have the power to lay and collect taxes without limit. And you may also have noticed that even as state politicians increase uh, taxation, they manage to spend more than they tax. Even though, for example, Californians, my home state, pay among the highest taxes, taxes in the nation, Democrats and Republicans have still managed to bankrupt our state. Clearly, something is wrong. But what's wrong? What? We can't fix again what is wrong if we can't identify what went wrong in the first place. To identify and verify what went wrong, it's useful to have a science of social causality to identify what? Social cause and effect. The founders of the Republic, in spite of creating the least oppressive state in political history, and I salute them for that, they also created a political government with a monumental flaw, a towering flaw. Here it is. The overarching flaw of American political government was the failure of its founders to implement an effective way to delimit or limit the le legitimized power of federal authorities to confiscate the people's wealth and freedom, as always, at gunpoint. Now, this is not to blame them. You know, after all, they flourished more than two centuries ago. A few like Jefferson saw the flaw, but they didn't know what to do about it. Sooner or later, all legal action to confiscate the people's wealth and freedom causes a laundry list of unintended consequences, all of them destructive. 
While the political fix for the political cause destruction has always been to initiate more political interventionism, which leads to even more destruction. Furthermore, the Constitution of the United States legitimized, codified, glorified, and rendered respectable the win-lose paradigm of social causality for us to gain, they must lose through force or fraud. That is respectable in America. By the way, the Canadian Federation of 1867 that created the Canadian federal state out of confederated provinces gave the federal politicians virtually unlimited power to confiscate the wealth and freedom of Canadian citizens, which is what they did. In American schools, the Constitution and its various articles were taught to children and college students as a secular document with near biblical majesty to rival holy wit. For over two centuries, the Constitution of the United States has reigned as the supreme law of the land. Its win-lose paradigms are fully embraced by the great majority of American people, and especially by educated Americans. The win-lose paradigm, wherever it is embraced, generates coercive action for win-lose gain. In America and abroad, in the so-called social sciences, the miseducation of the educated classes is rampant. But I might point out, even where there is some true education based on verified explanation of causality, progress in the physical, biological, and social sciences may be impeded or thwarted altogether because, in general, the longer you go to school, the more books you read, and the more intelligent you are, the harder it is to make key paradigm shifts on physical, biological, and social causation. For example, here's a very difficult paradigm shift to make for anyone who accepts the win-lose paradigm as true, and who accepts it to be true? Almost everybody on the planet, with only a few tiny exceptions. <coughs> It is to shift away, this is the difficult shift, to shift away from belief in the seizure of wealth and freedom to advance peace, prosperity, and, free, uh, free, uh, uh, to advance peace, prosperity, and freedom toward belief in the creation of wealth and freedom to advance peace, prosperity, and freedom. And so all people resist making paradigm shifts on causality because they know their paradigms are true and above reproach. There is no point in discussing it with me, Mary, Joe, or Frank. That's nearly everybody. Nonetheless, you can observe that all political systems generate win-lose domino effects which sooner or later preempt the limitation, they impede the limitation, they repeal the limitation, the limitation on the legal confiscation of wealth and freedom at gunpoint. Well, we've seen government regulation of the people's lives continue to escalate without the limitation. The price of ignorance of causality can be high. Please note, the ultimate end of either arithmetic or geometric growth of win-lose political regulation is fascism or communism. There will be never any exception to this generalization. These political systems have proven to be the greatest failures I'm talking about fascism and communism, imposing the greatest human catastrophes of any social systems in human history. In our time, why would any rational person with moral integrity want to go there? Well, that's exactly where we are going in our Western nations. Where is the delimitation on the advance of fascism and communism in America or Canada? Well, the question answers itself. 
There isn't any. How do we know? We read the daily newspaper. Please note, sooner or later, all political governments minimize the causes of peace, prosperity, and freedom while they maximize the causes of war, poverty, and servitude. Well, my friends, if the pervasive pervasion of American and Canadian prosperity and freedom is important to you, and let's look at another catastrophe imposed by American, Americans and Canadians by their respective politicians. There is virtually nothing, again, that I will say about political blunders imposed by American politicians that does not also apply to political blunders imposed by Canadian politicians. In America, this political blunder started at the state level in the mid-19th century before it later spread to the federal level. One of the most destructive things that local states, in your case provinces, has ever done is to confiscate created wealth to build what are called schools. Well, good grief. I mean, it's Nelson. What, what's, what could possibly be wrong with building schools? Well, it depends entirely on how you build them. There's just two ways. You can build public schools by seizing wealth and freedom or build private schools by creating wealth and freedom. The difference is more than academic. Please note, it is impossible to impose public schools upon people which are necessarily socialist schools that do not foster and advocate socialism. If there's any question about public schools being social schools, you can observe the public schools are funded through the confiscation of a people's wealth and freedom, both parents and non-parents. Even if you have no children, you're forced to pay for them at gunpoint. And what happens if you don't go along with this? Those who refuse to pay taxes levied against them to fund public schools will be fined, imprisoned, or killed. Now thus far in America, only an extreme case would you be killed for not paying taxes or, or on your you know, wealth of uh, freedom. In World War II, you know, only a handful of American soldiers were shot for desertion. Well, you could refuse to pay your property taxes that fund the public schools. You could do this. You tell the tax assessor in a polite letter, uh, Dear sir, uh, please take my name off your mailing list. <laughs> and finally, the authorities arrive, eventually as they will, to legally take possession of your house. But if you are a troublemaker, and you could be one of those, and as I'm looking out, I see potential troublemakers, you might say, hey, hey, you in the uniform, stop where you are. This is my house. It's paid for. It's been in our family for 100 years. Get off my land. And furthermore, you better listen up. The shotgun is loaded. But if you get off my land and stay off and mind your own damn business, I will gladly put my eight gauge short barreled Winchester back on the rack where it belongs. Dear friend, <laughs> if this were you and your house and your shotgun, you've got a problem, a big one. If you continue to be a troublemaker, you may wind up shot and killed, which would be perfectly legal without redress to the victim, which would be you. Now, I should point out, even so, you know, the authorities, the authorities do not want to kill you. 
Clearly that's the case. They just want you to obey. That's it. That's all they want you to do. Obey. And as soon as you obey, you're not a troublemaker. Obedient citizens are the good ones. They pay taxes. They obey the regulations. Of course, they do this or else, or, or else bad things will happen to them. One of the central aims of the public schools, which are social schools, is to inculcate the students to obey their socialist masters. A socialist state has no use for troublemakers. In fascist Germany, which was a national socialist state, in Germany, what did they do with all troublemakers? They were shot. They didn't waste jail time or feeding them. They shot them. in their national socialist state. Well, you may know today many who would say, but Snelson, that couldn't happen, certainly not in Canada or America. Why not? You know, they said the same thing in Germany before the Nazi rise to power in 1933. Can't happen here. The Nazis went on to murder 21 million Europeans. That number excludes battlefield casualties. The Nazis murdered 21 million Europeans, of which 6 million were Jews and 15 million were largely Christians. You might bring up 15 million Christians were murdered by the Nazis, not just Jews. It was all legal. Uh, well, another subject I'd like to discuss is human nature. A strategy for optimizing the causes of peace, prosperity, and freedom is to falsify the pseudo-intellectual fallacies that preempt the advance of these worthy aims. One social fallacy that must be falsified, repudiated, and abandoned is this mythical paradigm the mythology of human nature, it is human nature, it is said, to confiscate wealth and freedom through violent means and to seek gain through the loss of others. That's human nature. As long as this false paradigm of causality is held to be true, especially among the educated classes, institutions of war, violence, and tyranny will continue to rise. The mythology of human nature supports the war paradigm which says, for our nation to gain, your nation must be forced to lose. That's how we go to war. We follow the war paradigm. This false paradigm of social causality must be refuted, falsified, and buried in the scrap heap of intellectual trash. For thousands of years, intellectuals have been arguing the question, what the hell is human nature? The question is so important that if humans get it wrong, they can sink civilization. Win-win theory actually begins with the law of human nature. That's where I were, would begin if I were giving one of my seminars on win-win theory. I spent hours preparing my students for the social significance of this law. All I can do here in an hour or so is discuss it as another postulate without support. Nonetheless, without fanfare, here is the law of human nature. This law, I claim, must be understood and applied if we are to preserve our own species from extinction. Law of human nature is the inborn drive of all people to act toward gain and away from loss. Like all laws of nature, it never varies, it never changes, which means it is reliable and constant. Now you say, well, wait a minute. If human nature, if humans are driven to seek gain and avoid loss, 
but they're not driven to go to war, then why do they go to war? Very important to understand. Humans do not go to war because they are warlike. This is total nonsense. They go to war for a very simple reason. They don't know what they are doing. There's been no exception since the first war. This is street language for they fail to identify and verify which social causes lead to which social effects. Back in the Middle Ages, why were decent Christians, the best Christians, the most educated Christians, burning women at the stake? It was not because they were driven by their human nature to do so. They tortured and murdered these innocent women and children because they imagined, they imagined that these poor women had had sexual intercourse with Lucifer or other devils. Or at the very least, they had cavorted with them. It is human nature to act toward gain and away from loss, but what is not human nature is our individual perception of how to act toward gain and away from loss. How do we do this? Well, we act away from loss by burning people alive at the stake, who are the cause of all our problems. How we act toward gain and away from loss is governed by, guess what? Our paradigms of causality. Our chosen actions of how we act are governed by our models of which causes lead to which effects. Our paradigm of causality, our paradigms of causality, which are our models. Well, that was a slide that was supposed to go with the devils. I missed that, and here's another one. Um, our paradigms of causality, which are our models of truth and reality, govern our lives. All humans are governed by their paradigms. Did you know this? Your whole life is governed by your paradigms. Because your paradigms have been largely fashioned by people living or dead, your daily actions are governed by people living or dead. Well, do these often iconic people know what they are talking about? Is their now conventional wisdom any good? Or is it fallacious nonsense backed by the heavy weight of tradition and still respect of dogma? Well, the social effects of war, poverty, and servitude are caused by human acceptance of false models of social causality believed to be true by decent, respected people with good minds and educations. And so for humans to attenuate war, poverty, and servitude and optimize peace, prosperity, and freedom, they must possess wisdom and act accordingly. If you're intelligent, and I assume all you are, you surely know that's the luck of the genetic draw, isn't it? You were very careful in choosing your parents. And I compliment you for that, and your grandparents. Since the classical world of the Greeks and Romans, bright people have been arguing over what it means to be intelligent. There are two approaches you can take to answer this question. You can imagine what it means to be intelligent, or you can observe what it means to be intelligent. Philosophers imagine causality. Scientists observe causality. The difference is large. Because I use the scientific method to identify causality, I choose to observe physical, biological, and social action. You can observe the manifestations of human intelligence. Human intelligence is the measure of the innate potential of a human being to identify and understand physical, biological, and social causality. 
And so you can thank your ancestors for your innate intelligence, but it's not enough to be intelligent because intelligence only has potential value. We know that it is common for people to not live up to their potential. You've been meeting such people all your lives, am I correct? People who did not, do not live up to their potential. Anyone not seen such a person in your life? I see no hands. Whatever that potential may be, they don't live up to it. Over the decades, some of the brightest people I've ever met have also been among the most deluded people that I've ever met, especially deluded when it comes to knowing what the hell's going on. Have you ever met a brilliant fellow, a well-educated fellow, whose ideal model of society is socialism or communism or fascism, all of which are variations on the same collectivist nonsense, nonsense meaning it makes no rational sense. In short, all collectivism is esoteric, erudite bullshit. <laughs> In the Canadian language, do, do you have a word uh, equivalent to the Yankee noun bullshit? Is there Canadian language? What's the, what is it in the, what's the, if you're a linguist, what's the cognate in the Canadian language? Barnyard droppings. I'm, I'm not quite hearing it. <laughs> Barnyard droppings is a euphemism. What's the Canadian cognate in the Canadian language? Bullshit. Bullshit, thank you. <laughs> uh, when I get home, I'll... Check that out in my Canadian dictionary. Anyhow, <laughs> here's my point on the limitations of intelligence. Most people have missed this. Intelligence does not equal wisdom. Furthermore, if you're educated, congratulations, but it's not enough to be educated. Education does not equal wisdom. What does it mean then to be wise? What is the source of all wisdom? Six. Write me an essay. To be wise, you have to know what you're doing. To know what you're doing, you have to know which causes lead to which effects. And one way we do learn that is by making mistakes. One of the great disasters that parents impose upon their children in the last century or half century is they do not allow them to make mistakes. They shelter them from all mistakes and they raise crippled children intellectually. A socialist like this fellow you all recognize, who's this guy? Anybody? You've read his books, thank you. George Bernard Shaw. He may be intelligent, he may be schooled in all of this, he may have written entertaining plays, but he's a socialist and socialists do not possess wisdom on social causality. And so socialism and social wisdom are mutually exclusive. If you're a political governor, a bureaucrat of any kind, then you govern, which is to steer your subjects against their will at gunpoint. That's what they do. All political socialists govern their subjects by the win-lose paradigm. For us to gain, they must lose through force or fraud. Thus, all socialists are deluded because the means they employ, win, lose, coercion, cannot attain the ends they seek for a better world. In America, Canada, their respective political parties are in a bitter contest to see who can do a better job of imposing socialism on their citizen subjects at gunpoint. Well, I will begin to wind down this lecture, a uh, short lecture on win-win theory and the science of social causality with a few more generalizations, predictions that offer uh, some good news, because there is good news. Not on television, but <laughs> or in the newspapers, very little, but there is good news. Uh, th let me see a show of hands. How many of you have room in your life for more good news? They're just... <laughs> Or how many of you just so overwhelmed with good, good news, I just can't handle anymore? <laughs> right. 
Win-win theory is a science, and a science is humankind's greatest source of pragmatic optimism. Science always trumps pessimism. Whenever you're pessimistic, science always trumps pessimism. All arguments claiming, and here's the good news, the equity, utility, and morality of the win lose seizure wealth and freedom at gunpoint are falsifiable through the power of observational science. I have more good news. If you understand it, it is some of the best news you've ever seen in your entire life. All arguments claiming the equity, utility, and morality of the win-win creation of wealth and freedom are verifiable, verifiable through the power of observational science. To stay within the boundaries of science, win-win theory is a departure from earlier concepts of freedom. And uh, I even hesitate to get into this because it's a large subject, but give, just give you a little bit to think about. Win-win theory, for example, does not even presume that peace is better than war that prosperity is better than poverty, or that freedom is better than servitude. What social condition is somehow better than some other social condition is always a value judgment, which means it's beyond the range of scientific investigation. We don't get into value judgments. Moreover, win-win theory is not founded on any a priori concepts of rights, not natural rights, not property rights, not human rights, not absolute rights, not God-given rights, or any other rights. The concept of natural rights is anthropomorphic, as you know, which means it is a man-made concept. It is not nature-made. Now, to be sure, on the other hand, we've gotten social value from the 18th century invention of natural rights. There's no question about that to go from the king having all the rights to the idea that the people have certain rights, that's a big step forward in both equity and morality. But because the concept of natural rights is seriously flawed, it has taken us backwards, especially since the 19th century. Win-win theory, then, is not built upon the imagination of rights, but upon observation of the law of human nature, before developing win-win theory, I developed what I call optimization theory. Optimization theory is an applied science on how to optimize world peace, prosperity, and freedom. Well, these theories explain how to optimize whatever social scheme meets your fancy. For example, for those who would like to advance human liberty, it is important also to learn how to optimize not only human servitude, but human war, human poverty as well. If you don't know how to optimize war, you don't know how to optimize peace. To optimize the causes of war, poverty, and servitude, maximize involuntary exchange for win-lose gain. That's how to do it. We, now, we know there have always been people who would advance war, poverty, and servitude for their own win or lose gain, read the history books, but such people are largely impotent without the help and support of, guess who? Decent, respectable people who would advance peace, prosperity, and freedom by unknowingly, by inadvertently taking those actions that advance war, poverty, and servitude. And why do decent people do this? Very simple answer. They don't know what they are doing. If you know what you're doing, you don't do that. On the other hand, for those who would create peace, prosperity, and freedom, these profound benefits have an observable cause. To optimize the causes of peace, prosperity, and freedom, maximize voluntary exchange for win-win gain. And after nearly 50 years, as I said, of giving proprietary lectures and seminars on the matchless efficacy of creating human freedom, it's time for me to publish outside of my seminars to a broader audience. 
In a short while, my first book will uh, be published with the title of Taming the Violence of Faith, Win-Win Solutions for Our World in Crisis. Uh, if we can't tame the violence of faith, uh, if we can't tame the violence of political and religious faith throughout the world, we will experience world disaster at best and human extinction at worst. And so, taming the violence of faith, uh, this is a rather large claim, but it unifies elements of religion, economics, and science in advancing win-win religion, win-win economics on a foundation of observational science. Uh, if you're interested in ordering a copy, uh, we have sheets that you can sign up, um, uh, and we'll be happy to let you know when the book is in print. Will it be available electronically? It will eventually be available, uh, yes, in physical print and electronically. And you'll be able to get it electronically on Amazon.com. Um, also, I uh, did bring a few copies of my uh, V50 lectures which uh, Jan mentioned, and how many of you have now taken the V50 lectures? There's a, a, a number of you, certainly, uh, from Canada. Uh, I gave these uh, seminars uh, for about 14 years. They were given to thousands and thousands of students in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, this one particular seminar, I'll just say this, it's the only seminar I know of that's ever been given at, at, uh, where you can take someone First of all, most communists and socialists don't know that they're communists and socialists. They just embrace Marxian uh, philosophies and ideas without even knowing they come from Karl Marx or any of these things. And so that's most, most people, and interventionists in general, who believe uh, if we don't confiscate your wealth and freedom at gunpoint, bad things will happen to you. Uh, this seminar uh, has been responsible for uh, bringing people away from the win-lose paradigm to the win-win paradigm uh, uh, with a success of no, over, no other seminar I know that's been given. And over that time, we gave a full money-back guarantee, and uh, we had uh, three, re out of many, many thousands of students, we had three requests for tuition refunds. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, we have, you don't have one, to, we, they're out on the table here if you're interested. We just about handed out. Yeah. Uh, so I want to thank, just, I just want to mention uh, one last thing. I want to thank Jant for putting together what I believe is the first symposium on freedom that has ever been given where all of the speakers have one thing in common. They all believe that you can solve world problems without going after people with guns. And so you're going to hear more about what they have to say. And um, I want to thank Jayant for putting together this rather unique seminar, and hopefully you will find it of value. And if he puts on another one, you'll invite other people to join him here. Thank you. You have a question. All right. Um, so I was hoping you could clarify uh, how we apply, how you apply scientific epistemology to social to social issues, right? Um, so the Austrian economist, you know, in particular Mises and Rothbard said we can't take the ordinary scientific method uh, that, that applies to physical beings that behave in a predictable way according to destructible laws to humans who have free will. So how do you how do you take into account human free will when you're doing all right. I think the, the question, as I understand it, uh, von Mises and other so-called Austrian economists 
um, and who else, you mentioned someone, Rothbard, Rothbard and others, uh, claim that you can reach knowledge a priori or prior to experience or prior to observation. The whole foundation of von Mises' work is a priori um, explanation of economics. Uh, I would say, first of all, in my opinion, uh, von Mises was the most important economist of the 20th century. But on this point, he's entirely wrong. Uh, Rothbard is wrong. Uh, to fully explain this, that's a, that's a fairly sophisticated question. It would take uh, longer than we have here. But I will say this. Uh, if you read Human Action, for example, which is uh, the, the, uh, the great work by von Mises, uh, everything in Human Action that von Mises would recommend as a solution to economic problems, I can show how all of this can be observed a posteriori. Now, von Mises, if he were here, would be livid over that. You know, th this is an ongoing, a long time. This, uh, this argument before you were born, you know, was going on. Uh, but uh, my position is all of these uh, economic issues are within the realm of observation. We can do experiments. I'll give you an example of one of the greatest controlled experiments. You know, one of the arguments is, well, you can't do controlled experiments in the social arena. Well, that's baloney. That's pure baloney. People who don't understand science epistemology, you know, make such claims. But one of the grandest social experiments in human history was the Soviet Union. Here's, here's a political system that was based on the Marxian theme, the whole basis of Marx. He said, the theory of the communist is the abolition of private property. So that's, that's the heart of Marxian communism. Just abolish all property at gunpoint. OK? And that's what they did in the Soviet Union. But the problem is they ran into the law of human nature, and everybody doesn't cooperate. And so when you're in a state society, it's a fascist or communist society, if people aren't cooperating with your grand scheme, you just shoot them in the head. And so Stalin murdered somewhere in the magnitude of 40 million of his own people. Why? To try to make communism work. And you can't make it workable. It's a hopelessly utopian system. And no matter how little the communism is, it's, it's utopian. So that's at least a, I, I, I I, I could go on longer, but that might give you some idea where I'm going with this. So I'm saying that what what the what von Mises is my uh, first most important intellectual antecedent. So, but I don't I don't I make a point, and, and I have two others. I don't criticize my intellectual antecedents from the podium because I've gotten so much value from them, even though there's a lot of things I disagree with. There were. Thanks. In addition, there were two things uh, that I'm not sure I reconcile with your point. One is that you know science is value free, um, and then the other one was you said that you could you could verify morality and equity. So where do uh, where do we get those ideas of morality and equity that we verify through observational science? That's also a perceptive question. Uh, in my seminars, that would probably take me uh, a couple of lectures to lay the foundation for that. Uh, but I'll give you a little bit to think about. Oh, okay. Here was the, uh, the V50 lectures, which we have out on the, the table. Thank you. Oh, it's uh, uh, they're ninety-five dollars for the set, uh, which I'm willing to sign if anyone's interested. Uh, we'll take Canadian or U.S. Ninety-five U.S. or ninety-five. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they teach in Canadian schools, it's bad math. <laughs> right, that's right. Uh, okay, now I lost my point. I was about to say... Um, uh, oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, you heard me say that win-win theory is not based on property rights. And uh, th there you have a direct confrontation with certainly all of the Austrians not based on natural rights, you have a confrontation with virtually everybody in the freedom movement. 
Um, the, the, the difficulty is that if you are going to stay within the limitations and the, and the narrow boundaries of scientific epistemology, uh, there, are, there are no rights. There are no natural rights. There's no God-given rights. It's a human uh, conception, a human invention. It's okay to do that, but it's certainly not scientific. So you can't build a science on imagination. And all you can do, well, we imagine that God gave us these natural rights, or we imagine nature passed them on to us. Well, that's not scientific. But I'll just give you a little answer to this question. One of the grand conclusions, not a premise, one of the grand predictions of win-win theory and the science of social causality and optimization theory is that if you want to optimize world peace, world prosperity, and world freedom, then there must be some institution of ownership of property. How you do that, that's another point. But the whole idea is, instead of it being a premise, it's a conclusion. The same thing with morality. is It's not a premise, but it's a conclusion. I don't want to go on. My book, Taming the Violence of Faith, is entirely on that topic. And where I'm claiming, pretty boldly and audaciously, to integrate uh, religion, economics, and theology, and or unify at least elements of it. And uh, that, and, uh, and when that book's out, that will answer a lot of your questions, I think, too. But the excellent questions. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, I'm just sorry to interrupt. I'm Nancy Marks Nelson. Jay did not mention our website, and I would like to email addresses. Um, oh. Well, they, they took away the projector? Yes. So soon? Well, that was the last slide. I forgot to put it up. I know. The, web, the name of our institute is the Sustainable Civilization Institute, LLC. The website is www.susciviinst. It has just been created. Um, it wasn't even up when I left to come up here. Hopefully it is up by now. It is in its infancy. Please keep that in mind. Well, we'll put this slide up on the screen in a moment. Dot com. Excuse me. You can't. I, I couldn't write all that down if I were trying to write it down. So. We'll, we'll put it up, and I can give it to you later. Um, Jay, you can contact us through the website, but Jay's email is J, just the letter J, Snelson, at S-U-S-C-I-B-I-N-S-T. Um, dot com and mine is just M. Snelson. If you ever email Jay, by the way, he doesn't answer his emails, so you're always better off sending me a copy. Do we know how to get the slide up there? Oh, we got the. I don't know how to do it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Here's the the last slide I didn't put up, which has our information on it. Sir, um, sir, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, that was interesting. Uh, I just wonder if uh, do you think there's uh, any difference between anarchy and zero government and libertarianism? Okay. Is there any difference between those two things? Or is it all exactly the same? I'll comment on that. Is there a difference between uh, anarchy, libertarianism, and what else? Uh, zero government. And zero, zero government. And any, um, all right, I'll answer that. that yeah. That's a, a good question. If you look at the uh, history of anarchy, there's two branches of anarchy. There's the philosophical anarchists like Henry David Thoreau, for whom I have great respect. One of the great American intellectuals, Thoreau. Uh, there's also the bomb-throwing anarchists. Uh, you know, at least one of the presidents, uh, not presidents of the United States, I think, was, uh, was uh, murdered by an anarchist. Uh, the Chicago and the eight, uh, later in the 19th century, the Chicago, uh, what it was called, uh, where all those policemen were killed, was a bomb-throwing anarchist. Anarchy, etymologically, simply means uh, without state or without government. Uh, the, the etymology is a good term. I think the problem with calling oneself an anarchist, if one does not believe in violence, is a big problem. That word carries so much baggage with it, I think it's unsalvageable. So I would advise anybody who's an advocate of freedom 
to not call yourself an anarchist because the average guy can't differentiate from you and the bomb-throwing murderers who call themselves anarchists. Um, but even, uh, even without that, the, there's another problem with anarchy. Anarchy is negative in the sense that it says, well, we, you know, we're not going to have a state or any government, but it doesn't tell you how to create prosperity. It doesn't really tell you how to optimize peace, prosperity, and freedom. And so that takes a higher level of knowledge. To, that these concepts have to be built. And uh, you could have wall-to-wall -wall anarchists in a, uh, in a state of extreme poverty, because, it, because anarchy doesn't teach you how to optimize wealth. And then there was uh, libertarian. Uh, was there another term? Uh, zero government. Well, zero government. OK, I don't believe in zero government. I believe in zero state. There's a difference. Uh, when, when you, for example, uh, hire a, uh, a security service to uh, guard your house, I'm sure some of you have, you hire the, uh, the, you put up the alarm system and it's wired into the headquarters and if your house is breached, the message goes and they'll, you know, send the police out and so forth. I've just hired a government to protect my property, but I've hired the government. And so there's nothing wrong with hiring governments. The, the trick is, can you also fire the government? So if you can hire the government and fire the government to protect your property, that's fine. Uh, well, it's how I just, that's govern, it depends on how, govern, govern from the Latin gubernare simply means to steer. The word government is a good term, to steer. It just means to steer. There's two ways you can be steered. You can be steered by someone you hire to help you to guide you, like uh, if I if I take a, uh, if I take a uh, the Queen Mary two from England to to New York Harbor, I've hired the pilot to guide the ship. He's uh, he's uh, the, the the head. He's governing. The, governing means to steer. He's governing the ship. And, that, and do I want this guy to be competent? Yes. Can I fire him? Yes. Or not hire him in the first place? Absolutely. So uh, part, uh, part of the answer is you've got to have semantic precision. I never use the word state in a positive way. State, that's more of a European concept, but state means an institution claiming to provide you value that attacks you and confiscates your wealth and freedom at gunpoint. That's a state. There was some, another term you threw up that I, libertarian. I don't call myself a libertarian. Although it etymologically is pretty good, uh, because too many of the libertarians I meet are statists. Who are another? Who uh, we just got back from uh, what's called uh, Freedom Fest in Nevada. How many have been to Freedom Fest? Freedom Fest has <laughs> you go to Freedom Fest and they have outright socialists on the stage, full blown socialists advocating full blown socialism. And um, <coughs> they had like Dick Morris and Ron Williams and all of these guys advocating uh, that we take federal funds stolen from the people to set up socialist schools where you can determine who the teachers are. And that's just full-blown socialism. <coughs> so, and these people call themselves libertarians. So, so too many libertarians I know are advocates of the state, socialism, fascism, and communism. They don't know it. They don't know it, but, but they haven't taken the time to understand what these concepts really mean, and, uh, and there's no semantic precision. Liberal is a good term, and I'll end on that point. The, in, the, in the 18th century, the founders of the republic called themselves liberals. Liber from the Latin free. They were for freedom. And so you've got these, what, are, what we would now call 18th century liberals, you know, Jefferson and Franklin and all these guys were 18th century liberals. And liberalism was winning. Socialism, collectivism, communism was in the dumps. It was losing. Nobody was paying any attention to it. But they said, well, and, and so the socialist communists, George Bernard Shaw and all of these intellectuals, Beatrice Webb in Great Britain, and incidentally, Canada and America got most of our socialism from Great Britain because we're both Anglophiles. So we just love the whatever the British screw up the worst, we try to em emulate as best we can. 
and that's been the, the, the history of Canada and the United States. Uh, so the liberals were for freedom, which meant leave us alone. Or you've heard the term laissez-faire, let us alone. So then the socialists, communists, the Shahs, and all these guys said, no one's paying attention to us. What's winning? Liberalism is winning. And so the socialists got a bright idea, let's call ourselves liberals. They're the so part of the socialist victory today is everybody who, call, who would call himself a libertarian and for freedom calls the socialists liberals. In other words, every time you do that, you're advancing communism and socialism. They win because they weren't winning until they said, hey, we're going to be part of the, you know, what's really the hot thing, liberalism. And so don't ever call a communist or a socialist a liberal. You can call them a pseudo-liberal, anti-liberal, but certainly don't ever call them a liberal. Now that's hard to break because I hear people, I have students of mine, been students for decades, and they're still calling socialists liberals. You know, I say, excuse me, do you still want, but th this gets stuck in their head. So, does that answer part of your question? Anyhow, yes? I know it's something to speak, and if people don't uh, study it or understand it, they weren't told the grass anyway. Uh, but I'm looking at also some simple way to, uh, to distinguish the view, this view of women from women. So, in the law of nature, human nature, you describe human nature as the inborn desire of all people to act for gain and away from loss. So, given that, some people could choose servitude. But the key word that describes whether it's actually going to win or win or lose is the word involuntary. Anything that people are made to do involuntarily is violating human nature. That's correct. That, and the term is involuntary servitude or slavery. And uh, what, you know, in America, in Canada, you know, we're not subjected to bonded slavery. Like, you know, they don't have a chain around our neck, at least yet. And uh, so, uh, but we are subjected to involuntary servitude. I'm for forced at gunpoint to serve people I don't want to serve. And if I don't serve them, I'm fined in prison or killed. Okay, that, so we face involuntary uh, servitude. Okay. Once you have the law of human nature, you can seek gain through the gain of others, or you can seek gain through the loss of others. You can avoid loss through the gain of others, or you can avoid loss through the loss of others. That's a sharp dichotomy. And, the, and that's black and white. It is absolutely black and white. So the reason that, and here's my claim, the reason that people choose the win-lose paradigm for us to gain, you must be forced to lose over the win-win paradigm for us to gain, you must gain, is because in street language, they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand cause and effect. I repeat again, look, one of the best examples we have in history. If you read the New Testament and you read the teachings of Jesus, you will not find anybody who was a stronger advocate for nonviolence than Jesus. And it's time and time again. And then uh, Jesus, of course, was um, actually murdered legally. And his followers put together one of the most violent criminal institutions in human history, I call it win-lose Christianity, where they literally grabbed off the streets men, women, children, boys and girls, and tortured them and burned them alive in the public square. They burned babies at the stake. Did you know that? Of course we have to burn this baby. It's Satan's child. Can you not see this? Well, so here we have it. These are the people who are the top of the cultural pecking order, educated, intelligent people, the top people in the community, burning people alive after torturing them to confess to crimes that they could not have committed. I don't believe a human being could have a sexual intercourse with the devil. Some people do. I don't believe that's possible. Okay, why do they do this? 
they honestly believed they were doing the right thing. For example, the, they thought, well, this witch is causing the plague. How many witches do you think caused the plague? Who, 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 anyone else for zero? All right, what caused the plague? Here's a classic example of failure to understand cause and effect. What caused the plague? The plague, as all of you know, the bubonic plague, was caused by the rat and the flea and a pathogen. And this was the, what's called the vector of the plague. They should have burned rats and fleas at the stake. <laughs> not one witch, there were hundreds of thousands of these, but not one of them was guilty. And the one way I explain this is, in a simple sense, it was nothing more than a big mistake. It was all a mistake. In my book, Taming the Violence of Faith, I point out the murder of six million Jews in, in Europe. It was nothing more than a big mistake. The aims that they thought they could accomplish by murdering these people never could have been achieved. Impossible. So why are they doing this? They don't understand cause and effect. And so just as in medieval times as today, um, the most influential people are potentially the most dangerous, especially if they don't understand cause and effect and act accordingly. Does that deal with your question. I forgot what the question was now, so I don't even know, <laughs> know if I answered it, but yes, sir. You stated that it doesn't matter what the uneducated classes think. It only matters what the educated classes think. Since standing in a room of educated people, I actually like this idea. Unfortunately, I'm having some difficulty reconciling it with what I actually see in the world. And to draw on just one of a multitude of examples of this you could provide, I think the recent Arab Spring is a great example where an uneducated group in Tunisia started what is arguably one of the largest events of the last you know, year. And yet, and so I have a hard time seeing how this uneducated person, how does it not matter what he thought? Surely it matters a great deal what he thought. I didn't say it didn't matter what he thought. Uh, unfortunately, I, I led up to that one sentence uh, and, and, uh, and so you know kind of how this works. In a seminar, I might have given a couple of hours leading up to that sentence that you just pulled out, laying the intellectual foundation for it. It was, uh, even as I said, it was too overly generalized, almost like there were no exceptions. Let me rephrase it and explain it. Okay. Who are the people who are the most influential in either creating wealth or destroying wealth? They're the same people. A person, for example, here's what I mean by this. The most influential people have the following self-image. I'm intelligent. Well, they don't, maybe, maybe they're not braggadocio. They don't go around telling everybody how bright they are. But in their heart of hearts, up here, I'm an intelligent guy. I'm educated. I'm well-read. I'm successful. That's his self-image. Okay. Compare that to the guy whose self-image is, well, you know, huh, I'm not very bright. Just, I'm just not educated. I haven't read much. Uh, nobody listens to me. Is he correct? Nobody listens to him. Is he correct? Of course they don't listen to him. Who do they listen to? The guy whose self-image is, I'm intelligent, I'm educated, I'm successful, I know what's going on. Listen to me, and I'll tell you. All right, these people are the smaller, we got uh, nearly 7 billion people running loose on the planet. Uh, a, sm a small percentage of these people have the self-image, I'm intelligent, I'm educated, I'm a success. Now, when I get into education, which I didn't do here in any depth, it doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you went to school. So, you can have uneducated PhDs or educated people who didn't graduate from high school. I can give you uh, two of the most educated Americans who were high school dropouts, uh, two gentlemen named Wilbur and Orville Wright. What did these boys do? They invented an entire science called aeronautics. They are the inventors of aviation. Today you can get a PhD on some tiny little bit of what the Wright brothers started as high school dropouts. Whether they went to high school or, is irrelevant. They invented the airplane. And who, is, and who is telling them they can't invent the airplane? 
everybody, at least who was educated at the time, pretty much believed flying in a machine heavier than air, that's crazy, that's impossible. And who said this? Scientists of the day, everybody said it, this is absolutely crazy. Now, those were the educated folks. So, the people who are influential are primarily these people, and the people who are self-image, uneducated, unintelligent, unsuccessful, uh, they, in general, go along with what the people who are educated, successful, intelligent want, want to do. That's, that's the way it's always been. It doesn't, whether it's Egyptian empire or whatever, that doesn't mean that, there, that a person who doesn't have the self-image is some, uh, uh, should be demeaned or uh, in some way uh, given the impression that he's less of a person or that's, no, that's nothing to do with it. I'm just saying. So well, I might clarify, it's not a matter of education, but rather self-confidence. It matters what the confident people think and it doesn't matter what the unconfident people think? Not quite, because I haven't defined education yet. I'll define it. All right. Okay. And I'm, my wife tells me it's, uh, I'll, I'll end on this question because we have to wind down and carry on. Okay, education. Just this definition I claim will revolutionize the whole concept of education. Education is any increase in any individual's correct understanding of the causes of any effect. Education is any increase and any individual's understanding of the causes of any effect, physical, biological, and social. That's education. You can get education in or, in, in or in out of a school. And um, uh, unfortunately, the, the, uh, it, it would take, for me to give a critique of what's wrong with contemporary education, especially at the college and, uh, and university level, uh, you know, it would take, after I, you've already heard 14 hours of lectures, I would put on three more. You do have a lecture on the subject that is being digitized as we speak. Yeah, I do have a lecture on that subject. Well, the main reason to go to, and I'll end on, the main reason to go to a college or university is because people make such a big deal out of it, it's the only way to really understand what it's all about. <laughs> you know, well, I went there, and uh, otherwise, the guy that doesn't go, there's always that, well, you know, if I'd gone to college, if I'd gotten my MBA, or, or just a, a plain old BS, or if I'd gotten my PhD, you know, I could have been the great whatever. And uh, well, so that's, I would say, the main reason to go to college is just to find out what it's all about, and you don't have any illusions that thinking it's something that it's really not. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stenson. That was a wonderful speech. Um, I have done V50 three times, and I can almost beg people to do it. Mr. Stelson builds his case very slowly, but lays very strong foundations to understand many social aspects. Um, I. If people still want to have some coffee, there's still coffee and tea outside. You can carry on, but uh, we have to start the next uh, session.